my honor today to introduce today's speaker, Julie Hill. She was born in Hampton, Virginia. She resided in Norfolk for over 30 years. She attended VCU in Richmond, where she took courses in African cultural anthropology. She graduated from the University of Maryland with a Bachelor of Science degree, and she is the creator and executive director of Outreach Africa Lost Boys Foundation, an all-volunteer nonprofit organization assisting South Sudanese refugee children in Africa with their educations. The Lost Boys story began back in the 1980s as more than 30,000 children fled war toward Sudan and began the thousand mile treks through the deserts and jungles over rivers and mountains to Ethiopia and then Kenya. Only 3,000 of these children survived the journey and many lived in refugee camps. The British aid workers in the refugee camps named them the Lost Boys after the Lost Boys from the Peter Pan series. Later, many of the Lost Boys were relocated here at Hampton Roads, and Julie had a chance encounter with two of them, I understand, in a Ghent market. And her love of these people and the tragedies that they endured from their stories opened her heart to reach out and help them. 2006, she established the Outreach Africa in Hampton Roads, and her organization has been providing educational opportunities and so much more. As told by one of the lost survivors, there are things we don't want to remember, but I'll never forget Julie Hill, who became the mother of our community. She's always touched my heart, you can tell. I have always felt honored that Julie has chosen our church to attend. and We can see her here most Sundays. Many of us that are at this church and our church itself has supported her programs and her efforts and will continue to do so. I have had the privilege of knowing her for years and witnessing her love for the lost boys and girls and would ask each of you to give her a warm fellowship welcome as she comes forward to tell her story and the story of so many successful young men and women. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. I want to thank Dick Dingus and Bruce Shelton for inviting me to speak today. What I will be talking about largely involves my own experiences, including spiritual lessons and a few miracles. I'm always happy to come here on Sundays and to see all of your faces. One of the greatest things about being here among you is to know that each of you is here because you truly want to be here. You are not here out of fear or guilt imposed on you or a feeling of obligation. We come here because we feel a desire to be part of something wonderful that happens when we gather here together. This is a very important distinction. Doing anything out of a sense of fear and guilt rarely leads to a positive experience or outcome. Doing things out of a clear desire pulls us towards something good and positive, like our fellowship in spirit we experience here every Sunday. Perhaps some of you know the word desire comes from two Latin words, de meaning of and sire meaning father. So the literal translation of desire is of the Father. That is a powerful thing to know. When we need to make life decisions and are not clear on the best answers, it is always best to take the time to reflect on whether we are making our decisions out of desire or if we were making it based on a negative emotion. It is always good to, for us to check in on our emotions and our motivations. When you are making changes, ask yourself if it is because you're being pulled toward something or fear or guilt is driving your decision. Then you will find yourself at an unhappy destination. 
So please look at what is motivating your decision if you ever become confused or unsure. We are so blessed to have the fellowship to come to, to reform our oneness with God and each other. The peace and joy we find here is important to all of us. My time here helps me so much throughout the week when working to help refugees in Africa who are facing many and very traumatic situations. Another spiritual lesson I've learned is that if you see something or someone or situation that needs your help, don't wait for other people's approval. Go ahead and follow spirit to do what you see needs to be done. This lesson has allowed me to walk past my reticence and fears to step forward and when I saw distress and knew I could make a difference in someone's life. This is also part of acting out of desire. This permission to act without fear of opposition or disapproval opened up many new rewarding experiences in my life. The main one being following my desire to help the lost boys and girls and their refugee relatives in Africa. Dick knew my history of helping the lost boys and girls. He knew how meeting them has changed my life for the better and in fact had literally saved my life. As part of my story, I must tell you a few life elements that prepared me for my work with the lost boys and their families. I became interested in African cultures when in eighth grade, my friend Lucy Holland invited me to her birthday pajama party. And I know some of you right now must be saying to yourselves, oh Lord, she's going back to the eighth grade. But, but bear with me. <laughs> Lucy was the daughter of Dr. Jerome Holland, the president of what was then Hampton University, Hampton Institute, and is now Hampton University. I was spending the night with Lucy and her other friends in her family's home on campus, which was the president's house. This was a really big deal for me. I sat with her family at dinner, the most refined, intelligent, and cultured family I had ever met in my life. And in this massive dining room, I was surrounded on all sides, on walls, mantles, tables, and the floor with amazing African tribal art. I was in awe. I had never imagined anything like what I was seeing. It was at that moment I knew that there was a fascinating world in Africa that I knew nothing about. It ignited my desire to learn more about African cultures, but I had no clue how that could ever happen. As it turns out, I just had to follow the trail of breadcrumbs I've found throughout my life. This exposure to the amazing world of African tribal art at Lucy's home was my very first breadcrumb. And all of the breadcrumbs together would prepare me for my future work helping the lost boys. Later, when I was studying at VCU in Richmond, I found my second breadcrumb. We happened to have a visiting professor who was an anthropologist from the Museum of Natural History in New York City. Dr. Turnbull was a Scotsman who started out with a PhD in music from Cambridge University. After graduating, he was visiting a friend in Africa near the Aturi Forest in the Congo when a group of Mbuti pygmies crossed the road on which he was walking. He watched them cross, and then he followed them into the forest. After living with them for several months, he decided he must go back to Cambridge to study African cultures. When he finished his PhD in anthropology, he went back to live with the Mbuti Pygmy in the Congo for five years, where he was assigned an Mbuti mother and father to help him learn their survival skills and their culture. Excuse me. Although African anthropology was not my major, I took every course Dr. Turnbull taught. He shared with us his life lessons learned from living with the Mbuti. Through his teaching, I learned about people, societies, our human and spiritual connections, and to always look for the survival value and cultural practices, even those I don't understand. I learned most of all to not judge other cultures based on my own culture. A few years later, I found my third breadcrumb when I visited a friend who had become an artist in Philadelphia. 
My friend was both creative and fearless. She saw a need among refugee families from Cambodia who had resettled in the U.S. after the Vietnam War. The people were called the Hmong, H-M-O-N-G. The adult refugees who spoke limited English were recruited to work on the farms on the eastern shore. They were trucked down there from Philadelphia to work in the fields where they, along with the crops, were drenched daily by planes spraying pesticides. Even though these pesticides were neurotoxins, these workers were told that they were being sprayed with medicine. Imagine. These refugee workers were suffering from respiratory problems, eye problems, and their skin was peeling off. My fearless, creative friend Robin became aware of these problems and called a meeting of the children of the workers. Even though the workers could not understand English, their children could. The meeting was held in a church. Robin had a member of the Food and Drug Administration present along with a member of the Department of Agriculture. They explained to the children that they were there to help their families understand that sprays were not medicines to humans, but poisons. They wanted the children to tell their parents that as workers they had rights, that they should never be sprayed, that the field should, be, should have warning signs in the language of the workers, and that they could report these violations without any fear or trouble from the Department of Immigration. My fearless, empathetic friend served as my example of what one person on their own initiative can do to create a huge positive change for an entire group of desperate people. And I was hooked. Robin saw something that needed to be done and she just did it. I knew from then on that when I saw a situation with people who were helpless, I would not ask myself why I should help them, but only ask if there was any reason I couldn't. And at the same time, I literally began saying to myself, where is my tribe? Who is it that I am supposed to help? I continued on my own to learn about African cultures and tribal art through books. I bought every book on African cultures I could find, even making trips to the Metropolitan Museum in New York City and having them shipped home. In those books, I found my fourth breadcrumb. I, it was in one of those books in the mid-90s when I first saw photos of the Dinka people. In their portraits, some had an intense, penetrating gaze that seemed to reach directly inside of me. I looked them up on the very first computer I bought and read about the genocide of the Dinka and how they were being slaughtered for the oil under their land. I felt like they were my tribe. They were the people I had been searching for. But how could I possibly help them? I began writing letters to the International Rescue Committee and the UNHCR, begging them to do whatever was in their power to save this tribe from slaughter. I sent unsolicited donations to these organizations, not knowing if this would really help them. I had never met Dinka people, but felt spiritually connected to them and a tremendous desire to help them. Then in 1998, not long after I learned of the plight of the Dinka and began sending those letters, my life was derailed. I was so severely injured at work that I became disabled and spent most of the next three years in bed. I could not sit, stand, or walk more than a few minutes at a time. At that time, there was no surgery for this injury. I lived alone, I had no family who could help me, and was in severe pain and morbidly depressed. I felt like a burden to my friends because I had nothing to offer to them in return for their help. Then one day, my wonderful friend Becky Brooks came by to see me. Becky is Susan Thomas's very own sister. I was lying in bed having my ongoing pity party, telling Becky I was so grateful she came, but that I felt so unworthy and guilty because I had become a burden to my friends. And something Becky said to me at that moment completely changed my thinking. She told me that I should never feel guilty for being in need, because our entire purpose on this earth is to help each other. Becky freed me from my guilt 
and this was a big spiritual lesson for me. I still had an enduring depression because of the ongoing pain, sense of hopelessness, and lack of knowledge of how I could ever achieve my desire to help others. I did not want to die, but I had little desire to live. I felt total despair, thinking my life would never get better. In fact, I'd begun reading books on near-death experiences to find comfort in the thought of dying. I was truly lost and afraid. And I, and I began planning my exit. I ordered books on how to commit suicide. I ordered books I could leave to my friends on how to cope with the suicide of a loved one. But lucky for me, I have a stubborn trait some people call analysis paralysis. That is, when I need to make a decision, I feel like I have to research and analyze everything <laughs> until I have totally mastered the information. And this stubborn trait bought me a lot of time. I had made it from the time of my injury at the end of 98 to early 2002. I was 46 years old. I had spent most of three years lying in bed because it was too painful even to sit. I had to eat kneeling on the floor at my coffee table using my arm for support and then had to lie down again. At this point, I could walk for about 20 minutes at a time. I was a mess, but I was still alive. I had not found a breadcrumb in a long time, but then came the most important day of my life. I was finally able to drive to my local grocery store in Gatton where I knew I could use the grocery cart as a walker. When I entered the store, I saw something I could hardly believe. There in front of me were two boys bagging groceries and pushing carts. I knew without any doubt in my mind that they were Dinka. I could tell by the shape of their head, their unique facial features, their unique body proportions, and their skin color. There in front of me were the people I had been waiting to help for so many years. I can only describe it as a miracle for me. It was a profoundly spiritual experience. It was like a ceiling made of dark clouds parted and suddenly I could see and feel intense rays of sunlight shining down on me and on the scene in front of me. At the very moment I first saw Yak and Chol, this vision of strong rays illuminating Everything around me was in my mind, and I knew I was experiencing a miracle. And when I think about it now, I guess it was fitting that those breadcrumbs I'd been following led me into a grocery store. I didn't speak to the two boys that day because I wondered how they would process it if I made them feel they looked so different from everyone else that I could actually tell them the name of their tribe. So for two more days, I ended up coming back to the store and stalking them while they were. <laughs> on the third day, I decided I had to speak to them through the checkout line where Yak was bagging groceries. I asked him if he minded if I guessed which country he was from, and he said that was okay. So I said, are you from Sudan? And he explained, yes. And then I asked, are you Dinka? And he stopped what he was doing. He excitedly said, oh mom, you must have been to my homeland. And I told him I had not, but that I knew about his tribe and the difficulties they were experiencing. I realized later I had no idea what terror these boys had been through. At that time, I had never heard of the Lost Boys and asked how he happened to be in the US, and he said it was such a long story. I knew he had to keep bagging groceries, so before I left, I told him somehow I would find a way to help him and his friend, who also worked there. I realized that in many ways, I was better off than they were, and there must be ways I could help. I was still at a low point as far as emotional strength and courage, but finally realized that I didn't, if I didn't pursue a connection with them, what I had desired for so long, that there would be nothing else in my life wor worth doing. I found out where they lived and showed up at the door of their apartment. 
Like Yak and Chol, the boy answering the door looked to be about 19 or 20 years old. His name was Abraham. I asked if he wanted to learn how to cook, and he said yes. <laughs> so we got in the car with a complete stranger, and we bought groceries to bake a chicken and vegetables that night. I found out later that Abraham was legally blind. I didn't learn this until after I'd given him driving lessons. <laughs> I always wondered how he got his learner's permit. And for whatever it's worth, he drove the best of the four lost boys I talked to drive. <laughs> so back to cooking the chicken, the rest of the boys filtered home and found a stranger in the house. But they also found the smell of food cooking, so I was politely tolerated. <laughs> that night I noticed it was way too hot in their ancient apartment and that there was no air conditioning or even a fan. I suggested opening the windows, but was told that they were afraid of being kidnapped, as had happened to many of their friends in the camp. They told me the army would come to steal boys at night to make them child soldiers. I didn't want them to live in this unbearable heat or in fear of being kidnapped. So the next day I brought my drill and some nails. I drilled holes through their wooden window frames so that they could pin the windows open just a few inches to get fresh air and yet still be secure that no one could get in. They thought that was pretty amazing. That was the day we both realized that I could be of help to them. Then they let me drive them to go shopping and I listened to them giggle like little kids in my back seat, cracking jokes in their Dinka language. It didn't matter to me if I understood their jokes. It made me happy just to know that I was helping them feel happy. I was so grateful they were letting me become part of their lives. While I listened to them giggle in my car, I realized that I could be happy again and that we were saving each other. Since then, in the 20 years I have come to know them, I have met hundreds of lost boys and lost girls. I've been invited to their social gatherings and celebrations. I have grown to know them as my dear friends and even family. I've even been invited by moms to their hospital rooms to be present for the births of seven Dinka babies. For an only child and an only child who never grew up around siblings or cousins and has never been married or had children, my precious time spent with the Dinka and the other South Sudanese refugees has been a life-altering experience in my very own miracle. I'm very close to so many refugee families and two of the lost boys have become like my very own children. The first is a lost boy I met in the grocery store, Yak Chol Zerkuch, who I call my firstborn. The second is lost boy, William Paul Mayon, who sits here today, and many of you know him, and he's giving a talk after our service and it's very interesting. I'm sure you will enjoy it. William Paul Mayon is a living example of how we can all strive to live our best lives. During the times I was personally struggling, William would come to my house, hold my hands, and pray for me. You can ask, what would Jesus do, or what would William do, and the answer would be the same. My favorite saying of William's is, aim high, and if you fail, you will fail high. He always makes me smile. I'm so honored that William and Yak along with their wonderful wives who both named a child after me. Now this woman who you see standing here who has never married or had children has been blessed with children and grandchildren and somehow I've managed to never change a diaper. <laughs> I'm trying to hold the line. In addition to the miracle of being saved by the lost boys and girls, I've had the additional miracle of advancements in surgery. In 2018 and 2019, I was blessed with surgeries to screw my pelvis together that allow me to stand here in front of you today. As many of the lost boys and girls continue to remind me, God is great. As you all already know, we are all God's helpers. My work with refugees here and in Africa has allowed me to be witness to and be part of many miracles. I will leave you with the story of one spectacular miracle one of the greatest I will ever be part of. And please keep in mind throughout this story that it has a happy ending. Some details are disturbing, but you will be rewarded for bearing those details. I must also preface Anyang's story 
by telling you that God prepared me to help save people in a way I never expected. It is another breadcrumb. In my mid-twenties, I decided I wanted to help people medically, so I took a year and a half program in medical laboratory technology. During the program, when I was doing a training rotation through the laboratory, I landed in the chemistry lab for two months. That is where I learned my dyslexia was going to cause a problem. I didn't know the name for it, but I knew that I tended to read number sequences from right to left, which many people consider to be backwards. I didn't think it would matter since results were printed out by machines. Then I learned that med techs often had to read the lab results over the phone to doctors and nurses in other parts of the hospital who were treating patients in critical condition. I realized I could read a patient's blood sugar results backwards and accidentally kill them. I finished the program at the top of my class but figured I had wasted a year and a half of my time. What I didn't know was that many years later this medical knowledge will help me save many lives. So now on to the story of the miracle girl named Anyang Dengdu. Anyang's story began with a message to me on Facebook from a woman I'd never spoken to who lived in Ohio. She found our website online and was seeking help for a young man she had met on Facebook who lived in South Sudan. His name is Mel Dengdu and he is the elder brother of Anyang, the miracle girl. This woman told me that Mel wanted to go to school and asked me to contact him. I promised that I would. I continued to follow God's breadcrumbs to connect with people who most needed help, so I followed her lead and contacted 20-year-old Mel, who lived in Juba, the capital. I knew something the woman in Ohio didn't know, that the country had just experienced an attempted coup and that many villages were being burned down. I knew this young man needed something far more critical at that moment than an education. I could guess that he would have family members in grave danger, and I was right. When I called Mel, he was frantic. He said he had learned his younger siblings were trapped in an IDP camp, and that's an internally displaced persons camp, two days away. He said he had not seen them since he'd been taken as a soldier at the age of nine, but had learned that their current location and wanted desperately to rescue them. I immediately wired him the money to go by bus to save his siblings and bring them back to Juba. Mel must have thought that it was a miracle to have a strange woman in the U.S. call out of the blue and send him money to rescue his family. Mel made it to the camp and found his siblings. He called me from the bus on his way back to say he had three of his siblings with him but that something was terribly wrong with the head of one of his sisters. This was Anyang. He kept saying that her head was too big. I couldn't imagine what he was trying to describe, so he said he would send me pictures when they arrived in Juba the next day. And remember the happy ending that's coming when I describe Anyang's condition and know that she is alive and well today. I have to describe her so you will understand the miracle. He took his young sister to a restroom in a clinic where he took off her headscarf and he photographed her with front and side views, which he sent to me. What I saw in those photos defied all logic and everything I thought was possible. I was looking at a 15-year-old who looked seven. She had a beautiful face, but from the top of her head, from her forehead back to the nape of her neck, and from the tops of her ears across the crown of her head from one side to the other, I could see the detailed contours of her brain covered only by a membrane called the dura and very small islands of skin and hair. Her brain without a skull to conform to was assuming its own shape and slightly protruding over the edges of her skull. I was so shocked not only at her medical condition but by the fact that she was alive, alert and standing there posing for these pictures Incredibly, in Juba, Mel and Anyang were turned away from the first hospital where they sought help. The doctors there wouldn't touch her. Thankfully, the second hospital took her in. The wonderful doctor there agreed to treat her with IV antibiotics and keep her head clean and bandaged. Beyond that, the doctor and I did not know what to do. Even the doctor could not explain how she was alive and functioning. 
through donations, our nonprofit Outreach Africa paid $400 a week for her hospital care. The doctor ordered an MRI which confirmed that the bone of her entire cranial vault had been destroyed by infection, but that somehow the infection had not penetrated her brain, and that incredibly her spinal fluid remained within this thin membrane called the dura. This was an absolute miracle, and I knew I had to do something to save her. She could not stay this way, in this limbo, forever, and I was terrified for her while feeling overwhelmed by the responsibility. I prayed for a way to help Anyang. People here who saw her photos said that she could not be helped, but how could I turn this little girl out onto the street? To me, it was unthinkable. I approached Operation Smile, but they said they already had big projects lined up and that they could not help. Then my physical therapist told me his stepdaughter used to work for Operation Smile in Kenya and Ethiopia, so I contacted her. She said she still knew doctors in Kenya and Ethiopia and agreed to forward my email to them, which contained photos of Anyang and her medical records. I knew nothing about these doctors but prayed for a positive response. In the days of waiting, I talked to my partner in Outreach Africa, whose name is Anya. I told her that I did not know why, but the singular thought that kept coming to my mind was that somehow Norway was going to save this child. I didn't know where this thought came from, but two days later, I received an email from the only doctor who replied, and I nearly fell over when he said he was writing to me from Norway. He was a Norwegian plastic surgeon, burn specialist, who does skin grafting on burned children in Ethiopia. He runs a nonprofit in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, which is funded by Norwegians in order to save these burned children in Ethiopia. He said if I could keep Anyang alive for two more months and then get her to Addis Ababa, he would return from Norway to do the skin grafting necessary to cover her brain and give Anyang her only chance to survive. We had already been caring for her for for three months, so I figured we could hang off for two more. Not only was finding this doctor a miracle, but he said he would do her surgery for free, and his nonprofit would cover all of her hospital costs, which to me is another miracle. Two months later, we paid for her brother Mel to escort Anyang by plane to Addis. The doctor had already arranged for two neurosurgeons to prep her head for the skin grafts. Then the doctor did the grafting from her legs to make a nice new envelope of skin around Anyang's head. Imagine, this was so difficult for Anyang to endure, but she was very strong and had a very strong will to live. And remember, this has a happy ending, but it did take a few more miracles. There were some setbacks in healing as Anyang held on. The worst was a drug-resistant infection that began destroying the skin grafts. I was frantic. For some reason, the plastic surgeon was not culturing her wounds to identify the strain of bacteria that, to determine which antibiotics would work against it. Because I was trained in laboratory medicine, I knew exactly what testing needed to be done, but I didn't know how to get the doctor to do it. So I immediately began my search for help. It was 3 a.m. in the U.S. when I began, began looking on the internet for medical testing labs in Otis. I found one with two phone numbers. The first person hung up on me. The second number brought me to a Dutch parasitologist who spoke English and was part owner of the laboratory. I immediately emailed him Anyang's photos and history, and he promised he would go to the hospital the next day to take the samples himself and do all the testing and cultures for free. He reported the test result to Anyang's doctor and she received the correct antibiotics which saved her life yet again. It took almost two years of medical treatment in Ethiopia for Anyang to heal. During some of her recovery time, she lived for free in a Dutch children's home. God's helpers really are everywhere. And Anyang has many angels who have helped save her life. When Anyang was fully healed, the Norwegian doctor insisted on flying her from Addis to South Sudan to make sure she was handed over safely. She was received by an adult cousin who immediately brought her to Nairobi, Kenya, where her two younger siblings were eagerly awaiting her arrival. It was a very, very happy reunion. 
Anyang joined her siblings in our African boarding school program in Nairobi. She has now been attending our school program for seven years and will soon be completing her eighth grade exams. We've both come a long way. When I think of all my years and experience in helping my South Sudanese friends, including the many miracles I've been honored to witness and to be part of, I can truly say that God is great and God is good. God is working miracles every day, sometimes directly and sometimes through his helpers, like you and me. Each day I wonder how God is going to show up, and I continue to look for the breadcrumbs he has left to guide me. Thank you.